The word of God commands, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. By contrast, the United States is in a deep, dark financial crisis, not merely because of overspending and the national debt, but we are on the verge of the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in the history of humanity. Estimates range between 40 trillion and 60 trillion dollars that's about to be transferred from the baby boomer generation to my generation. That is, from the generation of my parents to the generation of me and my peers. Now, that has astronomical implications for the body of Christ and the cause of the gospel because not Not only is that amount of money being transferred from one generation to the next, it's being transferred from what has rightly been called the greatest generation, a generation that knew what it was like to scrimp and save and share and sacrifice to a generation of my peers that is basically me-centered and self-focused. And Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul speaks with more wisdom than the United States Congress and the chairman of the Federal Reserve. When he says, here's the remedy to meet the needs of others. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now my passion today, our passion this month as we learn this verse together is that not only are we generous, but that we are generous in a way that promotes generosity to our children and our grandchildren. That as parents and as disciples of Christ, we practice generosity in front of and with our children. Now I recognize the Bible says not to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when it comes to giving, but that's talking about the motive of the heart that we should not try to impress others with our giving so they'll think more highly of us than what is true. How many of you know we really don't have much of a danger of our kids thinking more highly of us than they ought to? They know us too well. But we don't want to practice generosity in front of and with our children for the purpose of trying to impress, but for the purpose of trying to instruct that we want to disciple ourselves and our children to go through life sowing the seeds of generosity. Now, the reason that I preach on our Scripture memory verse is because I believe it's going to be easier for us to memorize the Word of God if we understand exactly what it means. So I want to take this verse apart literally word by word and consider three things about sowing the seeds of generosity. First of all, notice with me the inspired reminder about generosity. Going back to verses 1 through 6, to me, it's almost humorous. I've gone back and forth between calling it inspired sarcasm and pastoral wisdom. On one hand, it seems a little sarcastic. On one hand, it seems like Paul's kind of gigging the Corinthians. But on the other hand, I think he's just a wise leader of God's people. You say, what do you mean, Brother Mike? Well, he starts off in verse 1 saying, it's not necessary for me to write to you about this, this offering. And then he spends six verses, actually two chapters, writing to them about the offering. He says, I don't have to remind you about this. And then he takes to reminding them. And I think the reason for this inspired reminder has great application for us today. He tells them in the opening of this chapter, I've been bragging about your generosity. It's obvious that he already knows the Corinthian church has promised to give sacrificially and generously in a special benevolence offering. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Word has gotten to the Apostle Paul that Corinth has made a deep-pocketed pledge. And he says, I've been bragging about you everywhere I go. I've told all the brothers and all the other churches, when we go around and start receiving this special benevolence gift for the church at Jerusalem, you better take some extra money bags to Corinth because they're a wealthy people and they are a generous people. I know you're going to give 
big and sacrificially. And I don't have to remind you about that. But I thought before I sent the team on collection day to get the offering that I'd send some brothers to remind you collection day is coming. And I know I don't have to remind you, but let me remind you. You need to do what you promised you were going to do. And he says in verse 5, I'm sending this reminder so that when the opportunity to actually give comes. Verse 5 says, so that you can give with a happy, cheerful heart, not as some grudging obligation. Let me give you just a, a simple illustration of how that happens in our own church. Oftentimes, whether it's a missions offering, a benevolence offering, offering a love offering for a guest speaker I try to give you plenty of notice that we're going to be receiving that offering rather than spring it on you at the last minute and you think oh man I didn't bring my checkbook today or I want to give but I need to move some money out of savings into the checking or I would have given but I didn't bring my credit card I can't even do the online giving I want to get brother Mike what time will the church office open tomorrow I'll run over from Waycross back over here and it becomes this grudging kind of obligation Paul says I'm wanting to give you plenty of notice not for the purpose of pressuring you but for the purpose of reminding you to do what you already said you wanted to do. Have you ever been in a Wednesday night revival service and we've been receiving an offering all week long? Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. And all week you've been planning to give, but it's just gotten away from you. And The pastor will remind you, tonight's the last opportunity to give. Paul says, I don't want you to get in a pinch Letting life distract you from doing what I know you want to do and what you've promised to do. Now, now, now you don't have to be receiving a benevolence offering for that to happen. You can determine in your heart, I want to be generous. I want to open my eyes, my heart, and my wallet to meet the needs of other people. And yet, at the same time, life can just distract us from it. We're so busy with our own life that with the best of intention, with the purest of motive, we let the opportunity sneak up on us and slip right on by. Paul said, I want to remind you to be prepared for the opportunity to give. Could I ask you, does your family budget allow for generosity? Or have you cut your budget so close to the quick that there's no wiggle room? Have you made preparations so that in that moment God reveals a need in the life of someone else, maybe a coworker, a friend, a classmate? You hear of some need in the community? Have you made allowances so that in that moment you can give gladly and not grudgingly out of some sense of obligation? Paul, under divine inspiration, gives this reminder. Now, with that in mind, let me just show you two things about it. First, the purpose for the offering. Now, the New King James translators add a, a word here. It's in italics. So, let each one give. That word, so, is kind of like the word, therefore. In light of everything we've been talking about, this is why you should purpose in your heart. So we need to stop and ask, what was the purpose for the offering that Paul's talking about? Well, he's not talking about what we would call the weekly offering at the church. This is not tithes and offerings. This is what we would consider maybe a special benevolence offering. Uh, maybe a missions offering. A couple of years ago when our student minister uh, at the time announced to us he was going to the foreign mission field, we took several months asking you and challenging you to make pledges to support frontier tribal missions. Because when Brother Scotty and his family went to Costa Rica and, and eventually on to Peru, we didn't want that, that, that last minute to catch you unprepared. And it's that kind of offering that Paul has in mind. Now, specifically, the offering here was for the church at Jerusalem. 
That's very important that you understand. This is a Gentile congregation, Corinth, taking up a special benevolence offering for a Jewish congregation back at Jerusalem. You see, during this time, the Jerusalem church was under intense persecution. People were being terminated from their jobs. They were experiencing even martyrdom. Women were becoming widows and children were becoming orphans. And there was great need in the church at Jerusalem. Now watch this. Not too long before this offering was being received, the church at Jerusalem didn't even think that Gentiles could be saved. You can read of that, Acts 13, 14, 15, and 16. There was ethnic tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. You saw that in the distribution of food to the widows in Acts chapter 6. There was animus and hostility between these two ethnic groups. And the group of Jews that previously thought the Gentiles couldn't even be saved are now in need of these Gentiles giving them a gift. For You see, friend, the purpose of this offering goes far beyond some Jews in Jerusalem that needed food and clothing. The, the, the purpose of this offering was to picture the power of the gospel itself. What would make a group of Gentiles give to a group of folks that didn't even like them, didn't really love them, talked about them, criticized them, persecuted them to the point that they thought you can't even go to heaven the way that you are. You've got to become like us. What would make a group of Gentiles act toward a group of Jews with a hand of generosity? I'll tell you, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To say nothing motivates me to do this for you except thinking about what Jesus has done for me. Could there be one in your life, your sphere of influence, that is in need of a touch of ministry? I'm going to say this again. I'm not talking about the offering box at the church. I'm talking about somebody in your neighborhood, in the community, and they need a touch of ministry from you for no reason better than this one. In and of myself, I'd be stingy, self-centered and self-focused but I give you this gift because Jesus Christ has done a work of transformation in my life and, and he's blessed me so much and now I want to give this to be a blessing to you do you know anybody in your world that might need a, a gift like that the purpose of this offering was not just to meet a need it was to picture and proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The purpose for the offering. The text also says something about the participants in the offering. So, let each one give. This is given to every father's child and every mother's baby. Not just to the super elite. Not just the pastor and the deacons. Not those who have some spiritual high class in the church. This is not even given, watch this, this is not even given corporately to the church as a whole. This is not in the plural. That all y'all as a unit give, but that each one of you give. Now we're blessed as a congregation to, to have pastoral leadership, staff leadership, and there's no question in my mind, if there was a need in our community, I could call a special deacons meeting together with our stewardship committee and it would be unanimously received that we take X amount of money out of contingency out of our savings account and we give a gift of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 whatever the need would be and the church through its leadership would write a check I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to do that on many many occasions last year alone giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars to missions causes through the ministries of this church but 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 that's not what this offering is talking about it's not something that we give as a group this is something that you give as an individual and Paul says it's not just something for the wealthy ones in the church I want each one of you to give. 
You say, preacher, I don't have a lot of money to share with other people. Well, Johnny Hunt is known for saying that you don't have to be rich to be generous. You just have to be generous to be generous. So let each one give. God wants each one of us to be generous. And by the way, if, if you have truly been saved, then at some point in your life... You prayed what this group sang just a few moments ago. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. You, you said, take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. That means at some point at a prayer of salvation and repentance, you said in essence, Lord, I give all of me to all of you. I surrender everything to you. And friend, if you have already committed everything to God, then it's not a big deal to give anything that God asks. Paul says, I want every single one of you to participate in this special offering. I want all of you to sow the seeds of generosity. Not only do we see the inspired reminder about generosity, but we see the internal reason for generosity. So let each one give, not as he's been browbeat, arm twisted, ear bent, guilt tripped, pressured from the stewardship team, eyes looking on from around. What does he say? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. That is something that you see externally stirs something internally. Something you hear about externally stirs something internally. Now if you go watch that Andy Griffith show episode, Opie's Charity, you'll find out toward the end of it that Opie is actually the one who had the generous heart and the generous hand. He was saving his extra money because a little girl in his school had a tattered coat. And he asked her, why do you have such a tattered and worn coat? And she said, because my mother doesn't have enough money to buy me a new one. And Opie was trying to save his money so that by wintertime he could buy Charlotte a new coat. He had seen something. A threadbare, tattered garment. And what he saw with his eyes stirred his heart. When he asked her, why don't you have a new coat, she said something. And what he heard with his ears stirred something down on the inside. This is one reason that I think each of our addictions to our cell phones can keep us from sowing the seeds of generosity because we rarely have our eyes up looking at other people. When we're sitting in a restaurant, we're scanning Facebook, we're checking Twitter, we're, we're, we're texting, we're, 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 we're doing all of this other stuff. And, and I think among other things, this text is calling us to, to not only get out of our phone, but to get out of our own comfort zone, to get out of our own life and lift up our eyes and open up our ears and watch and listen for the needs of other people. They are around us every single day. And when we have these external stimuli, it ought to move something down on the inside of us. Oftentimes when this happens in my life, I'm by myself in the car, in the truck, walking down the sidewalk. And, and I, don't I don't have any preacher to blame. This is just something I've become aware of and God has stirred something down on the inside. The internal reason. Two things I want you to notice. First, the source of the gift. So that each one give as he purposes in his heart. Now these days with electronic giving and all the different ways that we can give, sometimes we, we ask, where is that gift going to come from? We have so many options. I mean, if you wanted to give a special gift today, you could give by cash, you could give by check, you could put it in the box, you could put it in an envelope, you could go online. Online giving can be done through your checking account, it can be done through a credit card. You buy stuff online through an internet 
store and you can use PayPal and all of these different ways. And, and sometimes when we want to give a gift, we and our family, we have to ask, where's that going to come from? Are we going to take it out of the regular checking account? Are we going to take some money out of savings? From where will that money come? Paul says, regardless of where it comes from financially, let me tell you where it needs to come from ultimately. It needs to be a gift that comes from the heart. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Why so much emphasis on the heart when it comes to the issue of generosity? It's because the way that we view money and treat money and use money and share money is an indication of the spiritual health of our heart. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 21, the Lord Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now I hear that verse quoted and then misinterpreted all the time. Jesus did not say that your treasure will be where your heart is. He said your heart will be where your treasure is. Don't go looking for your heart to find out where your treasure is. He said go looking for your treasure to find out where your heart is. Because your heart is not found by what you sang about, clapped about, shouted about, tweeted about, posted about, Instagrammed about. All of that may be accurate, but it may be as fake as a $3 Gucci handbag. You want to know where your heart is? Look at your view of money. You can't be tight-fisted and open-hearted. You can't be clenched-fisted when it comes to money and be tender-hearted when it comes to the things of God. Now, I've lived long enough and I've violated this principle in my own life plenty of times to know that you can be a generous giver and not have a heart that's right with God. You can have an open hand and a hard heart. For example, when when news goes around town that a family, they got burned out last night, okay? Uh, I don't know of anybody last night, but just as an illustration, if you hear that somebody lost their home last night in a fire, even lost people can be moved with kindness. Even unconverted people can say, well, I think their boy wears the same size as my boy. Let me, let me get some clothes over there right away and let me, let me see how much cash I've got. Even lost people can be kind-hearted just from a sense of even unregenerate morality. Just the conscience that God has given to us. You, you can be generous and have a hard heart. But you cannot have a soft heart toward God. And be stingy. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Adrian Rogers used to say that if you'll show me two books about a man, I'll tell you just about anything that you want to know. Show me his checkbook and his date book. Now that illustration is already somewhat dated in our technological age. But but he said if you'll show me where you're spending your time and show me where you're spending your money... I'll tell you, he said, and I believe he's right, I'll tell you just about anything you want to know about that man. I'll tell you just about anything you want to know about that woman. I'll tell you just about anything you want to know about that teenager, that little boy, that little girl, what consumes their time and what pulls and and competes for their treasure. The source of this generous gift is the heart. And because of that, by the way, you're never mad when you give it. You wanted to give it. That leads to the second thing, not only the source of the gift, but the spirit of the giver. Did you see it? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. That's the positive example. Then he gives it negatively. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Not because you have to. Not even because you ought to. Though if you're going to obey God, you have to do what He lays on your heart. And if you're going to be right with God, you ought to want to obey Him. But the have to and the ought to is born out of the want to. 
not grudgingly or of necessity. One translation renders that word grudgingly as the word reluctantly, not not reluctantly. That, That word grudgingly in the Greek of the New Testament is actually sort of a preposition. It literally means out of or taken from. The word is actually used to describe genealogy, that this boy came out of or was taken from that man. It is used in extra biblical literature to describe birthing processes that were, how shall I say this, they were difficult births. The the, the mother was in distress on the birthing stool. And the doctor had to use um, extraordinary measures to get the child out of the womb. Paul in our day might say, don't make the Lord use the forceps to get that money out of you. Give it gladly. You know, here in the South, we've got a little saying, maybe you've seen the bumper sticker. Uh, Those of us who believe in the Second Amendment and, and the right to bear arms... It says, the government can have my guns when they pry them from my... Yeah, Paul says, don't... It's all right to have that attitude about your guns. Don't have that attitude, though, about your money. That God can have my money when he pries it from my cold, dead hands. Time out. You ever get the kind of attitude that if God wants to take what you've got and give it to somebody else... That he'll have to pry it from your cold, dead hands. He knows how to do that. He can do it in a heartbeat or the absence of one. Paul says, don't don't make God have to pry it out of your hand. By having the undertaker and the lawyer divvy up all of your assets and net wealth and distribute it to your children who would have a heart for God no don't give it grudgingly or of necessity now many preachers through the years have said that God will get money to you if he can get money through you and I I think that's true but I don't think it's the whole truth God doesn't need to give money to you so that he can get money through you in order for God to meet somebody else's need. God in his unspeakable power could meet that person's need a gazillion different ways. He he could just think something, speak something into existence that met their need. I mean, if they needed food, God could think food and their cupboard would be full. God doesn't have to have us to meet somebody else's need. He can do it on his own. The issue is not what, that God wants to give money to you that he might give it through you. The issue with money is what God wants to do with money in you. That, that God wants to use money as a tool of discipleship. Now, we, we've shared this principle before. Notice this statement on the screen. Man uses money to trade. God uses money to train. Man uses money to trade. That's why you'll take a $20 bill over to the Huddle House and you and your wife can have supper. You'll trade that $20 bill for supper. Or you'll take that $100 bill up to Sanford Stadium and trade it in for a Coke. (laughs) We use money to trade. God uses money to train. Not far from here, the Mossy Pond Outfitters, one of the top dog breeding and dog training kennels literally in America. And when they train a dog, they will train that dog with rubber toys, with with decoys and all kind of different training tools. If they're training a, a Labrador Retriever, they'll throw some decoys or toys out into the pond, and the idea is the lab is supposed to go out and get that toy and put it in his mouth, swim back to the shore, bring it to the master, and drop it at his feet or lay it in his hand. 
And if the dog doesn't do that, he's got on a shock collar. And if the dog doesn't want to cooperate, that, that trainer will hit a button and that dog will get a little shock right up here around the neck. And that's the way that they train that dog with a shock collar and some toys. Do you know what I think God does to train his people? He doesn't use rubber toys. He uses $20 bills. You know, the dog trainers will tell you that certain breeds will naturally go and fetch. You throw something out there, they will naturally go out and get it. What they have to be trained to do is get it and bring it back and take it to the owner and let go of it. It's natural for me when God drops $20 bills, $100 bills, $100 checks. It's natural for me to go out and get it. Don't look at me like I'm selfish. You'd slap your own grandma to get a $100 bill. Looking at me like I'm a stingy preacher. You know you. It's natural to go out and get it through hard work, through investment, through other ways that God gives us to honestly make a living. But it is not natural to go out and get it and bring it back to the feet of our master and put it at his feet or put it in his hand and let go of it. And until we're willing to go get it, to bring it back and let go of it, we've not been properly trained with how to use money. Don't make God use a shock collar on you this week. I mean, you be in the drive through at McDonald's, Spirit of God lays on your heart, tell the, tell the girl... You want to pay for the car behind you. And you sit there and you say, well, I can't pay for the car behind me. I don't, they may have bought super size. <laughs> they may have gotten one of those large caramel macchiato latte stuff I can't pronounce. And, and all of a sudden you go, oh, oh, oh. God shocks you. <laughs> I'm talking about the spirit of the giver. I think God often brings opportunities for generosity across our path just for us to see what we're made of spiritually. I can't help but think about the rich young ruler. You remember this man came to the Lord Jesus and said, what do I need to do to be saved? And, and Jesus said, you need to keep all the commandments. By the way, that's not the answer to the gospel. That, that was a teaching device Jesus was using. The man should have said, well, if I've got to keep all the commandments to be saved, I don't have any hope. But that's not what the old boy said. Do you remember, you remember his answer? He said, I've done all that. I've kept all the commandments. And to prove that he'd not kept a single one of them, Jesus said, okay, here's one thing you're lacking. Go sell all your stuff. Take the proceeds from that liquidation sale. Give it all away to the poor and come follow me. And the man walked away sad, the Bible says, because he was very rich. Jesus was revealing, your problem is you're a lover of money. By contrast, the Bible says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. There's a third and final thing I want you to note. I've called it the inevitable reward for generosity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Two simple things as we close this morning. Note, the first reward is a delightful giver. That is, God wants to give the money to you and through you that he might do something in you. And what is that? To make you a cheerful person. To bring you peace and joy, contentment and satisfaction. In his classic novel, The Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens describes Ebenezer Scrooge with these words. He's a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. No warmth can warm him. No wintry chill chills him. And no wind that ever blew was bitterer than he. And child of God, your heavenly Father does not want that kind of attitude from you. And he doesn't want that kind of attitude for you. Your father wants more for you than to walk through life with a hard heart and a clenched fist. In fact, the word that 
is translated here a cheerful giver, is the Greek word hilaros, from which we get our word hilarious. The idea here is that somebody is so excited, so joyful, so honored to participate in giving that their heart is filled with gladness. That's what your Lord wants for you. You've heard it said that you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Well, that's true, but there are some rewards for giving. So I'm talking about some rewards for generosity that I don't have to wait until I get in the presence of God to receive. I can receive some of those rewards right now by having the joy of giving to others. The, the first reward, there's a delightful giver. But, but finally now, there's a delighted God. For the Lord loves a cheerful Giver And much emphasis through the years has been made by Bible teachers about the cheerful giver. But there are two other words we better not blow by too quickly. For God loves a cheerful giver. Andrew and I have four children and each of them, just like their parents, can be self-centered. And I've also seen each of them, like their Parents, be generous and kind to others. Now, mom and dad, you know what it's like when you watch your children share something with someone else, give something to someone else. Whether it's sharing a toy, sharing some money, giving away a gift, when they have a heart of generosity, let's be honest, you want to put that on Facebook, don't you? Let me tell you what Poindexter did. You'll be talking to a buddy or maybe one of your girlfriends and you will say, little Jimmy did the, the sweetest thing today. Oh, it blessed my heart. How much more is our heavenly Father pleased when he sees his children share and give? God loves a cheerful giver. Now, on the day of judgment, I do want to hear him say, well done, but I don't want to have to wait until that day to hear the Lord say, I'm pleased by what I saw you do. <laughs> it is said of soldiers in the army of Emperor Charlemagne that when they came to Christ and were baptized, they were baptized with one hand out of the water. In that unbaptized hand, they held their sword. And the idea is, all of me belongs to Christ, except my sword belongs to Charlemagne. I think there are a lot of Baptists who sort of get baptized that way, with one hand out of the water. They don't use it to hold a sword, they use it to hold their wallet. I'm going to say this one last time and we're done. Look right here and listen. I'm not talking today about the offering at the church. I'm talking about, and Paul's talking about, going through life looking for opportunities to meet the needs of others. You say, preacher, how in the world would I do that? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver.